Welcome to Soundview Live. Today we are delighted to have with us author of the book Remote Not Distant, Gustavo Rossetti. Gustavo Rossetti is the CEO and founder of Fearless Culture, a culture design consultancy that helps teams do the best work of their lives. For more than 20 years, Rossetti has helped leaders from Fortune 500s, startups, nonprofits, and everything in between on every continent but Antarctica. Gustavo is also the creator of the Culture Design Canvas, a framework used by thousands of teams and organizations across the world to map, assess, and design their culture. In addition to his consulting work with clients, Gustavo regularly speaks with leaders and teams about culture change, teamwork, and hybrid workplaces. His coaching and tools have helped countless executives and teams develop work environments where people collaborate to accelerate individual and collective performance. A prolific writer and author of four books on culture change, most recently Remote Not Distant, Gustavo's insights have been featured in the New York Times, Psychology Today, Forbes, BBC, and Fortune, among others. In today's webinar, through insights, real-life examples, and exercises, Gustavo will guide you through the current rapidly changing workplace to improve collaboration, whether your team members work from home, the office, or both. Please welcome Gustavo Rossetti. Thank you, Sambu, for the invitation to join your audience. I'm super excited to be here and share some insights from my book, Remote and Distant. So I'm speaking here from Chicago, wherever you are in the world. I hope that we feel connected. I'm going to be sharing some insights. I'm going to be inviting you at some point to do some activities. So be ready to maybe pause the video and interact with the presentation. This is not just a one-sided conversation. What do I do, first of all, and what I'm here and what I'm going to talk about hybrid? Well, as you heard, my name is Gustavo Rossetti, and I'm a culture designer. What that means is basically we help companies understand what's their current culture, understand what's their desired culture, and help them get there. So basically, we design that process, that journey, which is not easy, definitely, but most importantly is how we bring intentionality to what it comes to building the right culture. So I'm going to see how the idea of a hybrid workplace had actually created an even more challenging environment to do that. And that's basically what I'm going to be covering, not only my experience, but also I interviewed hundreds of experts across the world from different types of companies that I'm basically a capture in my book. The first thing, and people ask me, hey, why did you decide to write remote, not distant? And I think there were many reasons. No one, because I write a lot, I do research, I do consulting. So I'm always trying to understand how I can help my clients and the community build better cultures. And of course, hybrid was a hot topic. But most importantly, I had this at the not only beginning, but maybe a couple of months into the pandemic, I was asking myself, well, what's going to happen next when people go back to work, when we go back to, let's say, kind of a new normal? How is that going to look like? And I started thinking that, well, maybe hybrid, you know, so some companies are fully remote. Most companies used to be fully working from the office in person. And I think, well, maybe this idea of hybrid could be the next thing. And of course, when I started my research, a lot of people say, no, hybrid is the worst of both worlds. But then things started to change, and which is important as we got more information, more practice, and more uh, tools to prepare ourselves to succeed. The key thing is, and I ask this to my clients, you know, who wants to go back to the office? We know that companies like Apple or Google, to name a few, in also Uber and Tesla, and got a lot of backlash. So they were forcing people to say, hey, we're going to go back to the office. They announced it. It was a top-down decision. So leaders made that call without involving people in the process. And all of a sudden, boom, people say, no way, we don't want to go back to the office. And this is important. When people say they don't want to go back to the office, it's not that they don't like the office. It's like they want to rethink how they work. They want to leverage all the lessons learned 
through the pandemic. And this is the, grad, the big divide that we're experiencing today. This is a huge, huge gap in the workplace. As I mentioned, on one side, we have employees that they really appreciate this idea of flexibility, you know, to choose when and where to work from. They want to integrate, they want the benefit of both worlds, remote and in person. And actually, more than 70% prefer this flexible mode and basically with a higher share of work from home. One thing that's really interesting, there's a lot of people, actually 72, 74%, depending on the research use, that say that if their workplace, their current job, don't offer them flexibility, they're going to go and work somewhere else. So this is a huge issue. It's not just something that's going to come and go. This is a huge trend that's becoming more and more important. On the other hand, we have CEOs that say, hey, working remotely, it's eroding our culture. They're also worrying about control because, yeah, we, to be honest, many leaders want to be there, want to observe how the people work, and they're also worried about productivity. So how can we basically bridge this gap and integrate these two what feel like opposing views. The most important thing is to understand that hybrid is a spectrum. When people talk about hybrid, they get stuck into feeling that there's one model and, and most of the models are basically trying to recreate the nine to five. So when they say, companies say, hey, now we're gonna work three days in the office, two days from home, that doesn't solve for the problem. That's just a band-aid, a short-term solution. So. What we see today is we have many models are still office centric. So they try to provide like a hybrid solution, but they still think that the office should be at the core of everything we do. On their hand, we have a lot of organizations that are thinking, and that's where you should be putting your energy into a more digital centric. It doesn't matter what we call the flexible hybrid. It doesn't matter the schedule, it matters what type of work do we want to do? And depending on that, shall we be at the office? Shall we work remotely? Shall we work all at the same time or asynchronous? And I'm gonna go into that deeper. So the first thing I want to touch on is what are the five trends that we observe? What are the five shifts that I uncovered along the writing my book and talking to different people, reviewing different uh, research? The first thing is what I call the fallacy of water cooler conversation. So most companies say, hey, we miss those impromptu talks, those encounters in which creativity and belonging were doing great because people get to it around the water cooler or around a coffee, whatever. The truth is, and people don't like to hear this, is there's no one single piece of research that shows that the water cooler conversations actually drive creativity. On the contrary, there's a lot of research that shows that those conversations are exclusive. Basically, people feel left out or their conversations about the people that are the meeting after the meeting. So when people leave, we start gossiping about our colleagues that are not there. So the point of our culture is we need to jump into a more intentional approach. We cannot just rely on, hey, if people are in the same place, either in a Zoom call or whatever, things are gonna happen. We need to design that experience. So that takes me to, I've been talking about culture and we need to level set. So what do we mean by culture? Culture is a system. Culture is everything that, how people feel, how people think and what people do in their workplace. So feeling could be how they feel about their job, their task, their manager, their colleagues, the environment. The thing is that mindset, how we filter reality. Do we have a positive mindset? Do we have a defeatist mindset? Do we have a learning mindset? We, a perfectionist, what are the lens that we use to see how we work? And then, of course, the behaviors, which is important, not only the things that we do, but the things that we don't do or should be doing. So. Talking about the shifts, I mentioned the idea of companies still thinking like office-centric and we need to start being more digital-centric in order to embrace the power and the benefits of a hybrid culture. 
I mentioned the idea that in the past culture was more like a built by chance. Let's it should be grown organically, but now it's even more important that we're intentional that we focus on designing that culture with a method. Managers used to measure input: how many hours people work, were people working, coming, to, arriving to the office early, leaving late, sending lots of emails. So that the input was a measure of a productivity. While today we need to focus on impact. How much work do people accomplish? What's the type of work that they accomplish? Do they do great work? It doesn't matter how much they work, but actually what they achieve. Another key shift is we were trying to find balance and actually was impossible because our personal and our professional lives are intertwined. And today, not only we see this work-life integration, like through the pandemic, we're able to get exposed to people's houses and their pets and their kids. So basically that will kind of disappeared. But on the other hand, I think that people realize, hey, I don't want to live around how I work. I want to design my work day around my life. So it's a huge shift that's becoming even more important. And the same happens with how we collaborate. We used to think that collaboration should happen in real time. And now we are discovering the power of asynchronous collaboration. We can work with people at different times with different methods and technology and still get a lot of great work done. And the last part, as I mentioned, hybrid is not a one size fits all. So in the past, we used to have a, hey, everyone at the office from nine to six, whatever the schedule was. Today, it's about flexibility, giving teams the options to build their own ways of working. So. The second step or second key part I cover in my book is how can we reignite belonging, which is a critical element, that glue that brings people together. It, since the beginning of the humanity, we've been always asking these questions. Am I connected? We all want to be part of a tribe. This is the difference between thriving or actually sometimes, especially in the past, not only failing, but actually maybe getting killed. Because when the human beings were developed a civilization, they rely on each other to protect themselves, to hunt together, get their food, and actually make sure that no one got killed by animals or any threat for the environment. So since those days, we still have this idea that we need to belong to a tribe. So every time we join a tribe, we join a company, we join a team, we're asking ourselves, do I feel connected? That's a huge, very important aspect of who we are and how we behave. So this brings me to the idea of rituals. Rituals in every aspect of a culture, not just workplace culture, are important to create that sense of belonging. Rituals shape our identity They transform who we are, how we think, how we behave, but most importantly, they help us belong to that particular group. Many companies have been successful in terms of adapting some of their rituals to the remote space. For example, Dropbox, they have this cupcake, smiling cupcake is one of their values, their core values. So when people used to work at the office, every time a new employee joined, they gave them like a box of cupcakes so they could, of course, eat them, but also share and establish some kind of connection with your teammates. Dropbox, after the pandemic, decided to go fully remote. So people are working from home, from co-working spaces, et cetera. So every time a new employee joins, they give them like a box, but in this case, it's a more important box, like with wood, a nice invitation. And instead of having cupcakes, it has the ingredients and the recipe for people to bake their own. So this is fantastic. On one hand, because the physicality, you're working remotely, but you get a gift, something physical, something tangible to connect with your company values. On the other hand, it challenges you to, hey, bake a cupcake, share the experience and the end result. Hopefully that it looks good through videos, pictures, not only on social media, but also in their own company media channels so you can interact with people and start conversations. So it's an interesting way of using rituals remotely. Rituals also help us improve behaviors. So this company, for example, they have the who's going to ring the bell. 
a ritual in which we're a meeting is not going well when people are getting stuck. Anyone can ring the bell. So what happens? Once people hear the sound, the conversation stops. People go silent and they start reflecting. What am I doing to make this meeting so unproductive? What can I do better? What can I change to make sure the meeting goes back into the right direction? So then the meeting resumes and people are energized, focused, and more productive, all doubt because of one single simple ritual. Another element of belonging is feedback. Feedback is critical. And I'm not talking about the annual performance reviews, which actually are not so good. They don't necessarily change behavior. But I'm talking about feedback that is frequent. So we see that in order to create a culture of feedback in a hybrid or remote space, we need to be able to and learn and practice giving more small doses. I call it the like the small bites, bit size of doses of feedback in a more frequent basis. For example, having regular one-on-ones, not just between the manager and their direct reports, but also across different team members. It's also important to learn how to become more open, to be ready to address conflict. In Usually in a virtual environment, it's hard to read the signs if people are not happy, if they're not agreeing with something that we're about to do. So if we address conflict early on before it actually becomes an issue, it's going to be beneficial for the team. Also how to mix synchronous and asynchronous feedback. So for little things, you don't need to have a call. You need to get on Zoom or Teams, Microsoft Teams. You just can maybe send an email or Slack message with, hey, look, I found this. We can do it better. That takes me to the other aspect, which is the most important opportunity or the biggest opportunity is to do or practice feedback as a team. Not just give feedback to one individual, but basically think of how can we play better? How can we work better as a team? And this is interesting, not only because it removes the finger pointing, trying to say, hey, who's the culprit, who screw up, but basically to think collectively, how can we all work better together? And last but not least, the importance of feed forward, as Marshall Goldsmith calls it. No? So rather than focusing on what happened, put all the energy and the time into, hey, how can we do things better? Because the past is gone, we cannot change it. Of course, we can learn from it. But the most important piece about feedback is how can we improve our behavior moving forward, not what we could have done better. The third step is about psychological safety. We want to make sure that people feel safe in our team environment. So they feel safe, not just safe as protected, but safe to take risks. No. As you can see on the picture, we want people to be able to take the leap, to jump, and the team is going to be like that safety net, be ready to embrace and protect and attract that team member that's taking the leap. No? So in the end, what we're looking is, do I feel safe in my team to take risks, to ask questions, to ask for help? And this takes me to the idea that psychological safety is not a, either you have it or you don't. It's more like different levels. And you can have higher levels or lower levels of psychological safety. So the tool I use, it's called the psychological safety ladder, and shows that we have three levels that we need to get. Many companies say, hey, Gustavo, how can I create a culture in which people feel safer to innovate? But I say, hey, if you don't accomplish level one and level two, you're never going to be ready to accomplish or to achieve or get into level three. So what is level one? Level one is about feeling safe as a human being. So I feel welcome. I feel accepted as a person. So it's easier to ask for help. I can talk about issues, personal burnout, for example. We know each other personally, not just as professionals. The level two is about having courageous conversations. So I can think differently. Not only it's okay, but actually my team encourages me to bring my own ideas, my own perspective, to ask questions, to share my thoughts in the open without judgment or without any kind of punishment. And only then, once we achieve level one and two, we can move into level three, which is innovation, what many companies are looking for. 
So people feeling safe to experiment, to make mistakes as part of that experimentation, of course, learn from them and questions and challenging the status quo. So how do we build psychological safety? Well, there's no one single solution. There's a collection of different tools that you can use. And maybe this nice moment in which after explaining this activity, you can pause the video and start doing this exercise. This is what we call washing instructions. The same way that our clothes have a label here that tell us how to be treated, we want to apply the principle to our team members because we shouldn't treat people like we want to be treated, but how they want to be treated. So this is an activity, not only you should do it, but also you should invite your colleagues to do it and then share. Now, for example, don't distract me if I'm in a productive state, count of me if you need help. I'm not necessarily comfortable speaking out in large groups. I like to listen to music when I work. I always need a bit more in coffee. Whatever that is, people can share their nuances and how they work, what they want, what they don't like, and make sure that you can treat them not only with respect, but according to their washing instructions. So pause the video now and do this activity and afterwards invite your team members to do theirs. Okay, I hope you, you enjoy doing your first round. And of course you can continue trading of a washing instructions. Now it's important, another thing, which is I'd mentioned the idea of digital first. So how can we level the playing field? So if you have people joining a meeting remotely, but other people are in the office, one trick could be that everyone joins from their own computer. So you don't have a lot of people in the room talking to each other and then the other are like an account. So level everyone's experience. Another way to do this is, for example, Microsoft always has a, someone to facilitate the meeting. And when it's a hybrid meeting, the facilitator is one of the people that are not in the room. So not in the room. So outside, they're joining remote. So they're more aware of the experience and they're trying to make sure that everyone can participate and have a fair experience. Another great thing about creating psychological safety, it's always assuming positive intent. So the team at a GitLab, they practice this, which is the short toes principle. If we assume that all of us, all team members have short toes, people would never step on yours. So this is, yeah, of course, we are not babies, we don't have short toes, but you get the metaphor. Where we're saying here is, Always assume that people don't want to get into your stuff. They don't want to screw with you. Maybe if they make a mistake, if they weren't clear, if something comes off, rather than jump and being judgmental, try to think, okay, they didn't have a bad intention. Ask what happened. Ask why before you react or judge or actually explode. Another exercise which is great to do with your team is nothing about me without me. So basically start make you more aware of how can you involve your team members in different conversations so they don't feel excluded, but also they can provide interesting points of view and you can make better decisions. So for example, what do you think? What views do you have on this decision that I'm about to make? Is there something I'm missing? What would you do in my place? So people like to feel included and this set of questions, this principle, it's also great to make sure that people feel not only they are part of the conversation, but their voices matter. The fourth part or step of my book, an approach, because it's not just a book, I also an approach that I use with my clients. It's how do we think the way we collaborate? So let me start first with what I call the collaboration trap. For many years, people have been suffering from collaboration fatigue. And working remotely, the pandemic made it even worse. What's collaboration fatigue? Basically, this push that we always need to be collaborating with every team, with every project, so inviting lots of people in order to make them feel included. But in the, in the end, people are working and they stretch too thin and they cannot take care of more projects. So one thing that's important is, first, you need to realize when the cost of collaboration is gonna be higher than the actual results. So at some point, it's easy to have maybe a small team take care of something, or maybe one individual without inviting others, that's gonna be faster and simpler. So 
collaboration or interacting with others is not always the solution. You need to be more mindful. On the other hand, another element of this trap is believing that collaboration means to work all together in the same time, in the same room, virtual or not. So I'm going to not only debunk that, but most importantly, I'm going to share a framework for you to rethink how you work. There are different works. I'm not going to get into details today, but I'm going to give you the big picture. So there are two types of work that we do, deep work and shallow work. Deep work, think about critical stuff, like defining your strategy, working on a new product, writing a presentation for customers, for your boss, for the board. Anything that's really, you know, or making a huge analysis on your sales to see what's working, what's not working. So things that are really critical that require a lot of time, but most importantly, concentration, focus. On the other hand, we have shallow work. That is answering a phone call, a replying to an email, sending a meeting invite, sending some information, chit-chatting with our teams, making a decision on a very simple topic. Okay, the point is, most organizations spend 70, approximately 70% 70 of their time doing shallow work, while actually it should be the other way around. Most of their time should be focused on deep work, work that not only requires focus and concentration, but it's going to create a much bigger impact on the organization than all the tiny little things that we take care of because we are always distracted. So this is a big shift. But then there's work that we can do on what we call we time, moments that we are together, either remotely or in person, and me time when I work on my own. So for example, focus work. As I mentioned, you're writing a presentation, you're doing it on me time, and it's deep work. And then you have deep collaboration, which is, for example, design sprints or evaluating a new packaging design for your new product. Well, that requires a lot of people working together and that's deep collaboration. So then for the rest, you can rethink how you apply that. So this is the first framework for you to start thinking differently about when to work with others, when to work solo, when you need to focus and not be interrupted. So once again, when you want to do deep work, you can do it remotely, especially if it's alone, and deep collaboration can happen also remotely or can happen in the office. So this starts to help us reconsider when people need to get together and where, and not just for, because oh, it's Wednesday, so I need to go to the office. Directly related to that is we need to leverage the benefits of synchronous and asynchronous communication. So some people say, hey, this is how most companies used to operate traditionally and still operate. That's why they have so many meetings, so many calls. And most remote first companies tend to be default to asynchronous. What I believe is that, yeah, we need to be default to asynchronous, but we need to understand the benefits of each system, each mode, and use them more intentionally. So for example, synchronous, it's great for speed and connection. So things that need to happen fast, if there's an emergency, if you need to tackle something and get people's response immediately, Synchronous is faster than sending an email or Slack message and waiting for people to respond. If you want to build stronger connections, if you want to align your team, if you want to celebrate a huge milestone or launch a team for a new project or something like that, well, in-person is usually stronger or at the same time. And then asynchronous, it's great for, as I mentioned, deep solo work. It's also great for making decisions. Some decisions you can put it on a document, you can share with the team, people can read it, ask questions, share their thoughts at their own time. Asynchronous being space for reflection, so we don't make rushed decisions. It's also great for regular feedback when I can provide things that I don't need to do it at the same moment so I can take some time, I can see things through perspective and relax, and then provide feedback, but also for critical topics that are not necessarily sensitive. When they become sensitive, very hard topics, then synchronous is best. So once again, I invite you to reflect on this. Moving forward, you should start thinking of meetings as the last resource. Basically, 
does it have to be a meeting? Are there other options in which you can collaborate, in which you can work together with your team that doesn't necessarily include scheduling a meeting and having to happen in everyone's a uh, around the same time? Another important practice that I like to share with my clients is the law of two clicks. Basically, it's the ability to give people the option to opt out. So if I'm invited to a meeting and I think that the meeting doesn't make sense to me, it's not adding any value, I'm not adding any value to the meeting, then I can opt out and go somewhere else. So it's not just don't attend any meetings at all and don't work, it's go and put your time where you're gonna make a bigger difference. It's called the law of two click. If you're in a Zoom meeting, you first you need to click to leave the meeting and the second click to confirm that you want to do it and move somewhere else. I mentioned GitLab, which is one of the most experienced and expert in remote culture. They have been doing not only great work, but also been great as a company in sharing all their knowledge with other people. And one of the things that they recommend is adopting a handbook first approach. Basically, document. Be very good about putting everything in a hub where people can find it easy. And if people have a question, you can simply answer with a link. You don't need to have a meeting. They don't need. And actually, what's important, if people know where those links are, they can find the answer by themselves rather than interrupt other people and distract them when they're doing great work on their own. The last piece that I want to tap in today, it's how to, how do we think about leadership? Because in the end, we also need to rethink the role of leadership to build these powerful hybrid cultures. One issue that we see has suffered a lot is trust. And when we don't see people, when people are not always in the office, or maybe never, or maybe very rarely, and if they are, maybe the manager is not there. So how can we trust the people that we don't see? Well, what does it mean to trust someone if you're always checking on them? Actually, trust means that people are going to take care of the work. They're going to do great things when no one's watching because you hire the right people and you're providing the right culture. So the first thing is how you trust people, even if it feels more uncomfortable. So my question to you is, and I maybe pause the video and, and think about it, is do you trust your team? Do you really trust your team? Or you're always asking yourself, are people going to do this? Are people going to respect my instructions? Are people going to follow? Are people working and not watching Netflix movies when they're not in the office? Take your time and think about it. Okay, so I hope you were able to come to a nice conclusion. And if you feel that you don't trust your team as much as you do, well, maybe the question is why? And don't put the emphasis on them, but about you, what can you do as a leader to build a trust? Trust is something that is a two-way street, no? So you as a leader need to take the first step. You need to be the one creating a trustworthy culture, trusting your employees so they trust you and they're going to show up and do what's expected from them. Another interesting thing about leadership is try to avoid copy-pasting the practices that you used to have before the pandemic into a remote or hybrid workplace. Many companies try to keep a culture alive but simply replicating things that they used to do. And in the end, they created lots of events, lots of meetings, lots of stuff, and people were exhausted. One thing that's important is maybe think about what was important about that activity that you used to have in the office. What was the why behind it? And with the same goal, the same intention, create a new thing, create a new event, but accomplishing the same impact that the prior activity used to have. We see also a demand for a different type of leadership. This is not new. This has been happening for many years. People don't want their leader, their manager to be a hero, to save the day, to be full of superpowers and be perfect. They want people they are human. They want people that are helpful. They want people that can help them find the answers and ask the right question. They don't expect their bosses to know it all. And especially in a complex a moment or era as we're living now. So rather than try to be the heroic boss, include people in conversation, show them that you're vulnerable, 
if you don't know something, it's okay to ask for help or tell them, I don't know. They're going to respect you more because you are honest, because you're candid, because you're human, that you try to hide things and show perfect because you're not. No one is. So summarizing the conversation today, there are five key takeaways I would like you to bring home after this conversation. The first is hybrid is here to stay. It's not going to go away. So don't try to get back into how things used to be before the pandemic. There was a revolution happening at the workplace and the pandemic amplified and people are going to go back to how things used to be. So rather than fighting back, embrace the opportunity. Building belonging is critical. We want to be part of a tribe, but the point is this is a never-ending job. It's not doing one or two activities. As I mentioned, I have hundreds of those in my book as well and other articles I've written, but basically it's a continuous job. So leaders and team members need to be more aware. The same happens to psychological safety. If you want to promote courageous conversations in terms of feedback, in terms of problem-solving discussions or innovation, you need to make sure that your people feel safe. So how you build that psychological safety, that environment for people to basically bring their questions, their ideas to the table. Another important element, we talk about rethinking how we work, rethinking how we collaborate. And that requires freedom, that requires flexibility and autonomy for people to choose not only where they work from, but also their schedule, when they want to work on their own when they want to have collaboration time to work with others. And the most important piece of advice, there's no magic bullet, there's no silver bullet or magic potion that you can drink and, hey, you're going to succeed. Each company needs to build their own solution. I spend a lot of months and years researching on how to design culture, talking to different experts, and I build a roadmap. But that roadmap it's not a solution, but basically it's a framework for you to do the hard work. You need to ask the questions, the right questions. You need to do the activities. You need to answer certain challenges that I posed there in the book. But most importantly, you need to test. You need to start small, go kick off some experiments, see what happens, adapt those that work really well, and then continue to iterate. So hopefully you enjoy the conversation and you can, of course, enjoy the sound view a summary of my book. And if you want to go even deeper, you can go and get a copy. It's available on Amazon and many other online retailers. And if you want to reach out to continue conversation, you can check my blog. I have more articles on the topic. And of course, you can shoot me an email if you have questions or want to just say hi. I hope there's questions that you'd like to see, and I'm open to, if you want to share those questions with Soundview, and then they can send it to me, and I will do my best to address all the issues and try to answer your questions, because I know this is important. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I know this kicks off a lot of challenges and thoughts, and probably you say, hey, but you haven't covered this. What would I do? Or I'm struggling with this aspect within my company culture, so let's chat. So once again, I want to thank you to Soundview for inviting me to talk to you, to your audience about how to build a strong culture in a hybrid environment. And I pass it over to the organizers to close the webinar. All of us at Soundview would like to thank Gustavo Rossetti for being our guest today. Join us next time for another edition of Soundview Live. <laughs>